Extract from the personal journal of Dr. Andrew Rasmussen, senior consultant the Gill Clinic, W1. It started with Lisa Ianson. There had been rumours before that, of course, of disappearing artists, fashion designers, literary critics, and of a sudden dearth of cafe philosophers in Paris. But most people simply closed their minds to it, refusing to believe that such a hideous disease could exist. Even in medical circles, its existence was almost brushed under the carpet, so that now, despite its several year history, it still lacks a proper clinical name. It's referred to simply as it, as in, has he got it, or did you read that so-and-so has it? But after Lisa Ianson, no one could deny its existence, as she succumbed so publicly, falling ill in the middle of a live broadcast of a late-night TV show. And that's when I realised that this wasn't just another hypochondriacal rumour circulated by a paranoid press, but was a real and utterly terrifying disease that made Ebla look like a touch of the sniffles. The broadcast was replayed endlessly over the following weeks, but I'd actually seen it live as I lay in bed unable to sleep, absent-mindedly scanning through the channels. It was almost as if I knew something was going to happen, something so profound that it would alter all human culture inconceivably. She was fronting a broadcast from a tribal gathering in Somerset, and had been spouting her usual pseudo-babble, when in the middle of a sentence, a fat bass and jungless rhythms on a distinctly Balearic handbag tip, if I remember correctly, we spent months poring over the recording to see if there was some kind of phonetic trigger to the seizure. She stopped talking and released a massive bowel clapping fart. Then, a puzzled expression on her face, she tried to continue talking, but despite her odd mouthings, no sounds came out. Instead, there was a sickening cracking of bones and a strange, wet, slopping sound, her abdomen folding in on itself as her pelvis cracked open inside her skin and her chest folded inwards and downwards with a nauseating, sucking noise like a basin draining of water. Within seconds she'd collapsed into her own rectum, her painted fingernails momentarily clawing at her sphincter to prevent the process, before these two were lost within its pink ring, and the Channel 4 camera was left focused stupidly on her contentedly pulsing anus. The director had quickly interrupted the broadcast, but even as the late-night adverts for telephone chat lines and local car dealerships flashed across the screen, I couldn't shake the image of the throbbing, fleshy doughnuts that was all that lef was left of Lisa Ianson from my mind's eye. No one had ever seen anything like it, and her condition was a talking point across the nation for weeks. However, everyone just assumed that it was an isolated incident, a rare biological occurrence like spontaneous human combustion. But it seemed as if within only a month or two of her succumbing, dozens, if not hundreds more cases were coming to our attention. Its early victims were almost all clubbers of various kinds, which led to speculation that it was somehow related to prolonged and excessive ecstasy use, or that it was perhaps triggered by a certain combination of ecstasy and cocaine, or a specific ratio of E and amphetamines. Because of its unusual nature, studies were even made where the relative wavelengths of sound were examined, and compared to the volume of the PA systems used in IT hotspots. From the government's point of view, this had a relatively beneficial side effect, as, fueled by a rabid and ill-informed campaign by the tabloids, Ecstasy use stopped almost overnight, those few people who refused to believe what they perceived as propaganda being treated as pariahs by their peers. It was at this time that I started my research work on it, and I have to admit that for a while I too believed what came to be known as the E-hypothesis. However, while the majority of its victims were clubbers, sometimes whole clubs would be discovered to be full of tiny throbbing arseholes pulsing away in time to the regular scratch of a needle at the end of a groove. I noticed a small number of other victims that seemed to contradict the prevailing belief put forward by the likes of the Express and the Telegraph that normal people couldn't catch it. A few literary theorists had also been found, in cafes, in their offices, sometimes in the archives of busy libraries, their fleshy ring pieces resting within feet of their new structuralist manuscripts, or winking smugly at the screens of their word processors. This not only confused the medical community, but it also raised panic amongst those who believed that these old academics, many of whom didn't even drink, let alone take Class A drugs, must somehow have caught it off their drug-ridden student body. But as we blindly thrashed around in the dark for cause of disease, let alone a test or cure, the number of victims started to number in the thousands. There seems to be no link between the increasing number of cases. Sex, age, lifestyle, sexuality, race, all seemed irrelevant. There seems to be an unusually high incidence in the capital, and relatively few cases in the north, but there seems to be no carrier agent in the water or the food chain that could account for this. And as artists, journalists, fashion designers and television executives all started to rank amongst high-risk groups, we had to admit amongst ourselves, whilst regularly releasing reports of new breakthroughs in research, that we were stumped. British and French filmmakers were high-risk, yet their American counterparts had yet to suffer from a single case. The Times had lost almost all of its staff, A.A. A. Gill being the first to go, disappearing so far up his own arse that he was one of the few cases who almost ceased to exist his succumbing only being verified by microscopic analysis of his keyboard, 
and the discovery of a few trace rectal cells, while the likes of Gary Bushell continued to pound out EastEnders trivia at an, an unaltered rate. It seemed hopeless. Homeopaths and faith healers regularly proffered fraudulent and cures, whilst others claimed that, that it was a combination of crystals could align the body's disturbed energy matrices and thus prevent seizures. Fundamentalist Christians claimed it was the wrath of a vengeful God on his hedonistic behaviour, while some groups, most notably the Californian It Transcendental Astral Pioneer Group, claimed that to journey at one's bowels was to raise oneself to a higher plane of existence. If they were right, no one could say, as they all succumbed within weeks of their formation. In the established medical community, we became so desperate that even twisted old quacks like Dr. Emmanuel Kokoschka, so-called expert of psychosexual disorders, was asked to help with research into a cure. I remember seeing him once at a conference in Brighton, and the first thing that struck me about him was the distinct relish with, that he went about his work. I saw him demonstrating the culmination of his feverish efforts and almost salivating as he fitted his Kokoschka rectal brace to a newborn young club chick, licking his lips as he pushed the rigid stainless steel frame into various of her orifices and wrapped the apparently, apparently useless metal struts around her pert young breasts. But the breakthrough came not from any member of the medical community but from a most unexpected quarter. On Thursday the 11th of November 2008, the cause of it was discovered, and along with it, a cure. It was during a broadcast of BBC Two's Newsnight Review, watched by some million viewers live in their own homes, that this breakthrough came, and again I was fortunate enough to see this pivotal moment of medical history live. Whilst discussing the Turner Prize exhibition at the Tate Modern, guest reviewer Valdemar Januchak, many of the show's regulars having unfortunately succumbed to it, was holding forth on one of the video installations and claiming that it was a zeitgeist capturing work that effectively reflected, with ironic distance of course, the post-millennial tension of the contemporary artist, when there was a sudden, sickening crack. Janicek twisted uncomfortably in his chair as he released a long, slow fart. His sternum started to noticeably crease under his shirt, and I, along with a million other viewers, watched the scene in terrified anticipation, knowing what was happening, but praying that it wouldn't. It was then that Tom Paulin, apparently unaware of what was occurring at the other end of the table, announced in his laconic Irish tones, uh, This is just a collection of rubbish by a bunch of talentless no-hopers. The cracking and squelching stopped, and I watched in rapt awe. You can't possibly be so fine, or the works of the Chapman brothers, for example, Yanachak coughed out, like most it victims unaware of his predicament, and the snapping continued as he slid under the table, his torso being sucked into his bowels as he spoke. Ah, rubbish, said Paulin. It's all utter twaddle. It's the sort of thing a sit for art student would produce if he was trying to be clever. And the noises stopped again, and Yanichak, reluctantly nodding in agreement, popped out of his own rectum as if being born again. And then the stunned Mark Lawson, realising the importance of what he'd seen, sputtered something about a cure for it, for this was indeed the first time that an it seizure had ever been reversed. For unbelievable as it seemed, the noted poet and critic Tom Paulin had discovered something that, uh, that had eluded the finest medical minds in the world. He'd discovered a cure for it. Once the cause had been verified as indeed being unembarrassed pretentiousness and shameless strivings to be street, the Ministry of Health issued a massive leafleting and television campaign warning of risky behaviours. White kids had to stop pretending to be Jamaican, hanging loose and sputtering cod patois while those with no direct links to America were advised to stop using American Argo and wearing t-shirts emblazoned with the logos of baseball teams they'd never seen. Middle-class kids were told that assuming a working-class accent was incredibly high-risk behaviour, as indeed was their parents' leanings toward pretending to be wealthier and more successful than they actually were. The expressions keeping it real and respect due were found to be an almost guaranteed trigger for it, the leaflet's warning of their danger having only half of each expression printed on two separate flyers, employing two different printing firms. Whole sections of libraries were deemed to be high risk. In many institutions, rows of modernist and postmodernist work were pulped, lest they lead the unwary into danger, and the modern French literature section disappeared altogether. The ministry's spin doctors, themselves a high-risk group, came up with the it equivalent to their predecessor's Don't Dive Ignorance campaign, the rather simple phrase, for fear of the disease itself, call a spade a spade. Thus all pseudo intellectualization ceased, no more Marxist analyses of bus timetables or revisionist theses on the carry-on films. And I have to say, for I was one of them, it seemed as if out of the hideous spectre of it had come the promise of a future golden age. Rock stars could no longer claim that their music was a political statement, but had to begrudgingly admit that it was trivial rubbish that they'd banged up when drunk. 
Politicians can no longer avoid answering questions by giving pre-prepared, convoluted and deliberately confusing statements, for obvious lying and half-hearted bullshit was also a primary cause of it. And of course, the Italians had to finally admit that they were not great lovers. It seemed as if mankind was suddenly placed in a world of total honesty where things were as they appeared, and people concentrated more on what they actually believed, rather than what they believed it was fashionable to say. However, and I'm ashamed to admit that it took me so long to see this, as it was in fact about two years after the cure had been developed, there was the inevitable downside. At first it was just a few minor annoyances, those things that irritate without really drawing your attention to them, the never-ending oasis on the radio, the Guardians and Times' exclusives on bordellos in Tipton and sexual peccadillos of Coronation Street stars, the RSC's dozenth season of Andrew Lloyd Webber musicals and reenactments of selected episodes of Classic Blind Date, for example. But it only really hit me how profoundly the disease had impacted on the world when I went to the Tate Modern to see the latest Turner Prize exhibition. As I walked around the gallery, there was just row after row of the same kinds of canvas. The cream of the work of Britain's most exciting young artists consisted almost entirely of paintings. No videos, no installations, no happenings. There weren't even any photographs. They were just paintings, all of them figurative, man at a bus stop, couple on the beach, Scottish castle, and dozens and dozens of pots of flowers, and all of them painted as classically as possible. No primitivism, no expressionism, no impressionism. Just flowers, on tables, in pots. Even the likes of Damien Hirst to produce row after row of still lives, although he had tried to challenge the disease and the ever-vigilant curators by exhibiting his famous bisected cow with a cardboard notice stuck to the case saying, this is just a bit of rubbish I knocked off, nothing special really, written on it. And as I left the gallery and flicked through my copies of Take a Break and Loaded, I looked at the people around me, some genuinely happy in this new dumbed-down world, but some reading their rugby magazines with a smile and a glint of quiet desperation in their eyes. So now, even though the number of new it cases has dropped to a slow trickle and our funding's been cut, I think I may have finally found a cure, an alternative cure, a less costly cure, for this terrible disease that's changed everything. Dozens of it cases have been cured with a simple enzyme derived from the liver of the turbot, of all things. In my hands lie the possibility of curing most, if not all, it patients, and of providing a vaccine for everyone else. I've taken the vaccine myself and have suffered no ill effects. But it's a great, a terrifying responsibility. For days now I've been staring at Lisa Ianson's anus as I consider the possible repercussions of my actions. Perhaps for now, I'll just sleep on it. Leave it till tomorrow. After all, I'm tired, and Proust takes some concentration. <laughs>